Her genius was raw, and it was just there, and she had it, and she did it, because I don't think she chose singing per se because she thought she was a great singer, or because she wanted to sing. I think, I think she really didn't know what she wanted to do. Them that's got shall have, them that's not shall lose. So the Bible said, and it still is new. Mama may have, Papa may have, but God bless the child that's got his own, that's got his own. Oh, she had this, the, the, the heart and soul, and she had stuff to do to make you cry, and hey, who could ask for anything more? How many other artists who created masterpieces had unsurmountable personal problems? And we celebrate the fact that a person with those problems could achieve such a high level of aesthetic statement. That's what's important. Seventh Avenue from 139th Street to 133rd Street. Prohibition was on its last legs then. In those days, 133rd Street was a real swing street. It was jumping with after hour spots, restaurants, cafes. And mostly memories now. Billie Holiday's autobiography was published in 1956, three years before the genius singer's death at 44. The book portrays her as more the savvy student of society and pitiful victim of life than her friends and relatives recall. Mom and Pop were just a couple of kids when they got married. He was 18, she was 16, and I was three. As we risk talking about her when she's gone, let us set this part of the story straight. When Billy was born in 1915, her mother, Sadie Fagan, was 19. Her father, Clarence Holliday, was 17. The young lovers did not ever live together. They never married. Billy, whose given name was Eleanor Fagan, may not have been born in Baltimore, but in Philadelphia, where Sadie Fagan seems to have fled to escape her family's disappointment that she was unmarried. But the exaggerations do hold a deep truth. They reveal the person she wanted to be, her values and sense of life. And when she tells about the music and the inside world of musicians, she is usually quite accurate, sometimes eloquently so. I used to love to sing all the time. I like music. If there was a place where I could go and hear it, I went. One of Billy's stepfathers, Wee Wee Hill, recalls that at home in Baltimore, Billy was singing all the time while doing chores, taking a bath, or just walking through the rooms. It was at the town's good time houses and crib joints that she perfected her craft. Arriving at age 12 in New York, at the height of the Harlem Renaissance and of the Jazz Age, she found she could make money singing in speakeasies, gin mills, and reefer pads, often working table to table for tips. In the early 1930s, wealthy jazz booster, later far-seeing record producer John Hammond, first heard Billy at an uptown club and began trying to assist her career. In 
November 1933, Hammond cut the first two records of 18-year-old Billie Holiday. She was the girl vocalist with an integrated studio band including Gene Krupa and Benny Goodman. In later years, Billy laughed off my mother's son-in-law, saying her voice sounded high and funny, and certainly the record did not sell. Still, it had the promise of the truly great studio dates just around the corner. I started moving from club to club in Harlem, and everywhere I went, something was happening. Later on, John Hammond paired me up with Teddy Wilson and his band for another record session. I know her eyes a billion, but go slow. Oh, oh, don't you all get too familiar? Why do you think she's coming to town? Just wait and you'll see the love of a little Miss Brown to you is baby to me. Yes, yes. She didn't know whether anybody's gonna like her or not. Really? You know, because it was nobody. Not a soul that I know of, uh, but Pops, who was, Louis Armstrong, who was singing that kind of hip way of singing, you know. And when she said that Louis Armstrong was one of her idols, I can under, I can, I can dig it, you know. But the one fun I'm watching to see, because the one I love soon come back to me. I covered the world of fun in search of my love, and I'm covered by the solid skies above. Oh, Betsy. Well, she was crazy about Louis, but uh, every person is and was. Uh, that's because of the way she attacked the words and, and, and could swing, just like a trumpet player. Unless it was the records of Bessie Smith and Louis Armstrong I heard as a kid, I don't know of anybody who actually influenced my singing then or now. I always wanted Bessie's big sound and Pop's feeling. Billy grew up in Baltimore's rough and ready section called Fells Point. She was first called Billy by her father, Clarence Holiday, guitarist for the Fletcher Henderson Band. She chose the new name after seeing screen star Billy Dove, whose smooth elegance the young singer wanted for herself. She was such a regular hooky player, she was placed in a home for wayward girls at age 10 and never passed beyond fifth grade. She detested cleaning for whites. I didn't want to be nobody's damn maid, she remembers. So she skipped past Baltimore's white steps to hang with the hustlers and prostitutes of the point, the night creatures. In Baltimore's bordellos and good times houses, Billy first heard Louis Armstrong and Bessie Smith on graphophones set up for patrons' enjoyment. Billy was not only a favorite pity baby of the customers, but she sang along with records or house piano players to make the good times roll. My man's got a heart like a rock yes, in the sea. My man's got a heart like a rock yes, in the sea. What Billy put on uh, records was a, was had a different sound than Bessie. Her Billy's blues were more modern. She's a blues singer in the sense that she's dealing with material which is mainly developed from the 12 bar chorus statement, is it? It's 
more than I can bear. I've got those long man blues. I've got those long hanging back again blues. Many times her songs are confused with the blues when they're not. When she's closer, she's as close to being a torch singer. You know, wearing a heart on her sleeve, which blues singers don't do, and, and much of her her, her material uh, is, is is closer to torching than riffing on the blues. Now, but if you say she's a jazz singer, she was a jazz singer. She had instant tonality. She had a fantastic ear. She made sounds that was to me was so hip. You know, she never was too much of an improviser as far as jazz was concerned. But she never stayed either straight with the melody. She had a fantastic conception of uh, of music to not have had any formal training. She never learned to read music or to know what key she was singing in. Like many jazz musicians, she played by ear. As part of a gig or at an after-hour session, whether or not for pay, Billy often would sing with just piano accompaniment. According to the great tap dancer Honey Coles, she sometimes would team up with two or three acts, including himself, perhaps another singer, and a comedian to take turns working a small club for tips. Every morning after I finished working, there was always a big jam session on somewhere. Cats would come up after they finished their gigs in the big studio orchestras, and they would sit in with the greatest guys around. A jam session was an ultimate workshop. You heard the different voices, different ways of stylizing tunes, different approaches, different definitions of what was going on. Out of the jam, the cutting challenges, the sly flirtations, the leapfrogging exchanges of friendly as well as confrontational expression, Billy's artistic identity was forged. It was at one of these sessions that I first met Lester Young. Lester's voice-like horn, Billy's horn-like voice, the most perfectly matched instruments in jazz. A lot of people thought they were lovers, but they never were. They were brother and sister types. You know, he loved uh, uh, Sadie, uh, Billy's mother. It's just like talking to a bunch of friends. When you hear uh, Lester go this way, you have something to go with it. Personally... I always tried to play with Lady, but I didn't want to obstruct any, anything that she did. And if she had a special pretty phrase, I wouldn't play in that until she came to the end of the phrase. Then I would fool around a little bit, what we call uh, fill up the windows. We didn't really have to rehearse because Teddy was, everybody on the record session was great. So we didn't bother about the arrangement. The only thing we needed arrangement was the introduction and the last course. Other than that, it was all, you know, everybody go for itself. Many people marvel at the fact that uh, not a lot of rehearsal was involved in the production of a number of really fine Billy Holiday records. Uh, it's marvelous mainly because it sounds so good, but the, the process is not marvelous at all. They simply lived the music at all times, and she was working with people whose styles and whose approaches and whose feelings and whose values she knew. 
program of ultra-modern rhythms comes to you from the Savoy Ballroom, known as the home of Happy Feet, located in uptown New York City. Besides the music of Count Basie, the singing of Willie Holiday and James Rushing is heard here nightly. Everybody in that band's timing was perfection. Curtis, Lester Young, and uh, of course the rhythm section, Joe Jones, Walter Page, Basie, and Freddie Green. They were called the All-American Rhythm Section. And that was, if you didn't have time, you didn't make it in Basie's band. She could sing anything because if she couldn't swing, she couldn't have been with Basie's band because he had the swingingest band in the land. And that's where she became Lady Day in the Count Basie band. Lester Young gave her the name of Lady. Lady Day was what Lester called Billy's mother. That was Lady Day. And Lady just took it. You know, no, if you knew Lady Day, you wouldn't be surprised. If you knew Billy Holiday, you wouldn't be surprised. And she just took it, because he didn't call Billy Lady Day at first. He called her mother, because she used to cook these marvelous meals and invite everybody that Lady wanted to invite to her house. The way you hold your knife, the way we dance till three, the way Get off the bus after a 500 mile trip, go into the studio with no music, nothing to eat but coffee and sandwiches. And I say, What do we do? Two bar or four bar intro? Somebody say, Make it four in a chorus. Then I say, You play behind me the first eight less than. And then Harry Edison would come in or Buck Clayton and take the next eight bars. We were like brothers. Whatever we felt like doing in the bus, of course, we lived in the bus. Oh, let's see, I would say Bass's band did. 251 nights a year. If 
We had to ride four or five hundred miles on the bus. Most of the band would go to sleep, but Billy was, didn't want to go to sleep. She'd stay up all night, hanging out, talking with the guys. And she would shoot craps in the back of the bus. She just did everything we did. Well, I had I had had her records before, but the first time I ever saw her in person was at the Apollo. And she was kind of plump, but sexy looking, you know. I didn't think then that she was sexy, because I didn't know nothing about sex then anyway. But now that I look back at it, she had a way of, which, which hand was it? It was the left hand, I think. She held up like this, and one hand was like this. And she never changed that position, you know. And she smiled a lot, and she was beautiful. What a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful woman. Drum and clarinet make an unusual combination. But Artie Shaw prefers the unusual. Artie came in and got to talking and dreaming about his new band. He thought he needed something sensational to give it a shove. Something sensational. That's easy, I told him. Hire a good Negro singer. Just remember that I am waiting there. If ever you want me, I'll be near. Any old time and any place where you may be. Well, Artie Shaw was big at the time. He was playing at uh, the Ritz-Carlton in Boston for the summer. So she began to be heard by the white audiences, and they became very, very avid Billy Holiday fans. But this would have been fine, except that I had to double it with another vocalist. There were some places where the management wouldn't let me appear, and I'd have to sit in the bus while she did numbers that were arranged for me. It wasn't long before the roughest days with the Basie band began to look like a breeze. I got to the point where I hardly ever ate, slept, or went to the bathroom without having a major NAACP type production. When she was with Artie Shaw, who uh, did a great thing, because Artie, you know, he said, he said, they said to him, you can't do that, you can't have a black singer. He said, yes, I can. And he took Lady, and then it got so bad when they would travel that... Lady just left. You know, they gave her a hard time in certain parts of the country, and um, so she just had to give it up. But it wasn't because he didn't want her. He really dug her to death. Billy uh, was uh, just at the beginning of her important days when she worked the Cafe Society. Uh, she had been working clubs uptown in Harlem and uh, the musicians had been following her around everywhere she worked. And the word got out downtown about this great young singer called Billie Holiday. And uh, the Cafe Society downtown was the only place you, uh, a black couple could go, come downtown and feel comfortable in the room amongst uh, white patrons. I knew all about Billie Holiday because when I was quite young. I was lucky enough to have a family that loved music and they bought a record collection and among the records that they had was a record called Strange Fruit. And, and Billy had started to sing Strange Fruit at the Cafe Society and when she stood so erect with a pin spot on her head in a darkened room and uh, uh, Particularly when she sang Strange, Strange Fruit, it was so dramatic. It just, you could hear a pin drop in that room. That really blew me away. I'd never heard anything like it. I knew it was banned. I knew why it was banned. And uh, without knowing her, she became an idol of mine. I recorded Strange Fruit because Billy went up to... Uh, 
Columbia's offices, they wouldn't let her record it because of the content of the song. It really was the, the very first important protest song and uh, with the anti-lynching motif and uh, they were afraid of their southern dealers. Well, that wasn't too political. That was just straight life facts, you know. Uh, if you know the lyrics of that tune, it's straight. It was, that's what was going on at that time. It's not that Columbia was against it. They just didn't uh, want to have trouble and bad press, I guess, with their southern dealers. And uh, they wouldn't let her cut. First of all, to them, it wasn't a pop song, and it really wasn't. It was a special song. Her voice had an intimacy. You felt that she had lived through the lyrics she was singing. She knew what she was singing about. And she also has that kind of thing they call charisma, I guess, that makes somebody think that they're singing only to you. Southern trees bear strange fruit blood on the leaves and blood at the root black bodies swinging in the southern breeze strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees pastoral scene of the gallant south the bulging eyes and the twisted mouth scent of magnolia sweet and fresh then the sudden smell of burning Here is a fruit for the crows to pluck, for the rain to gather, for the wind to suck, for the sun to rock, for the tree. To drop. Here is a strange and bitter That's what everybody went to the cafe society to hear in those days. Was uh, Billy do that number? Of course, everyone liked everything she did, but uh, that was what really started her. Well, I think up until that point, uh, singers just sang songs. They didn't. They didn't get too dramatic about it. But Billy was had a heavy, had a, had a strong feeling for drama, and she put this into the music, and that gave it a completely different quality. Billy Holiday was never a person noted for a fantastic voice. It was her interpretation, her de delivery, her sensibility that she was able to get into her, her musical statement. By 1940, Lady was a rising star. Across the nation, her records were played on jukeboxes and on the radio. Serious singers of all genres were acclaimed by her unique sound. Now, Billy took her place not so much as the lady who swung the dance bands as the small combo lady whose subtle art scared the blues away from nightclubs and cabarets. Thank you. 
of folks scattered. And I know you cheat, but right and wrong don't matter. The most important thing a, a, a vocalist has to work with is, is lyrics, you know. And if you're a jazz, if the melody ain't that hip, you can improvise on that fella anyway and make it the way, almost the way you want it, you know. Billy's interpretation of lyrics was very direct. She got inside of a song. It was thrilling because she could make you cry. She could make you feel bubbly and happy. She really... She could really communicate with you. I'd just like to dream of a cottage by a stream with my man Where a few flowers grew and perhaps a kid or two like my man And then my eyes get wet I most forget till he gets hot and tells me not to talk such right. Oh, my man, I love him so he'll never know. She didn't have a single good married relationship. Oh, my man, I love him so She was manhandled by a number of them. One in particular... I'm not going to mention her name. She was deathly afraid of him physically. I, I have been in taxi cabs with her and her man, whatever, whoever her man was at the time. And she punched this cat, man. Anybody she couldn't get, she really wanted. You know, she could get him. The... They were always her booking agents, too. And they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't do anything right. They wouldn't give her her percentage sometimes. Well, you know, we all need something different. And maybe that's what she needed. Maybe that's the only thing she knew. What's the difference if I say I'll go away when I know I'll come back on my knees someday? Take 52nd Street in the late 30s and early 40s. Swing Street, they called it. Joint after joint was jumping. It was this new kind of music. They could get away with calling it new because millions of squares hadn't taken a trip up to 131st Street. From 1939 through the 40s, Billy was queen of Swing Street. Backed just by rhythm and maybe a horn, she headlined all the street's leading cabarets. She quickly became the svelte lady of the gardenias, who, at $2,000 a week, was one of the highest paid black performers in America. People I'd met in Harlem, Hollywood, and Cafe Society used to come in, and there was always some kind of reunion. I was getting a little billing and publicity, so my old friends and acquaintances knew where to find me. You know, she felt the warmth from her musicians, and she felt the warmth from the public. In a way, that was her love, probably her greatest love. And all she needed to be happy was to be working. You know, and, and, and getting that response, getting that interaction uh, from the audience. Her fans sat close to her as she transformed the American songbook, including a few blues, into the Billie Holiday songbook. But soon she was labeled the street's moody woman, she who showed late and made scenes, some of them loud and rowdy. Then the street's worst hazard, the white dust. After 1942, a good night meant she came in fixed. Even so, her voice floated above the rhythm, accenting and shading notes to make the coolest of ballads a swinging drum song. She was a jazz musician, and she responded to the moment. And uh, the moment changed. Be because of the audience, the moment would change. I sang to different kinds of audiences. So them changed from flannel to khaki. And it always felt like everybody was closer together than before. Like we were all stranded in the same big stone. Get your hat. Leave your worry on the doorstep. Just direct your feet to the sunny side of the street. Life can be so sweet on the sunny side of the street. 
she was fabulous in the studio. She was right at the peak of her career then. Right after that, I did that. I went into the club next to Jimmy Ryan's. I think it was called a band box. And she was singing Lover Man. And I knew that that was a natural hit. I don't know why, but I'm feeling so sad. I long to try something I've never had. Never had no kissing. Oh, what I've been missing. Love a man, oh, where can you be? Billy asked for strings on the date, and first I uh, didn't want to do it. And then uh, I went with her, and we. We use six fiddles on the date, and uh, and it's a the record just got into the Naris, the Record Academy Hall of Fame. Love a man. And you'll dry all my tears. Then whisper sweet little things in my ear. A hugging and a kissing. Oh, what we've been missing, love a man, where can you be? I just saw a movie not too long ago with, with her and, and uh, Bill, Louis Armstrong, I think, the way she played a maid or something, and she wasn't that great, you know. It's not that they gave her any great lines to say, you know. Do you know what it means to miss New Orleans when that's where you left your heart? Envy. Didn't I tell you not to let me catch you at that piano again? I'm sorry, ma'am. If I'd have heard you coming, I wouldn't have let you catch me. Oh, Envy, you're incorrigible. This is Miss Merrily. Hello, Envy. Welcome to New Orleans, Miss Merrily. Oh, thank you. Oh, let me fix you a good hot tub, and it will melt away all your tiredness. Wonderful. About the only lines I had called on me to say, yes, Miss Merrily, no, Miss Merrily, in 23 different kinds of ways. Indeed. Yes, ma'am. She was lady, <laughs> you know, the most unlikeliest person to be a maid to anybody. Yes, ma'am. There's no one in the world like my Satchmo. Satchmo? That's yours, the Satchmo. His real name is Louis, but I like Satchmo best. When the moon's kind of dreamy, starry eyed and dreamy, and nights are luscious and long. If you're kind of lonely and all by your own lips, then nothing but the blues are brewing. The blues are brewing When the wind through the willow Blows across your pillow And tells you sleeping is wrong If love goes a searching Till you feel like virtue Then nothing but the blues are brewing, the blues are brewing, oh, you want somebody, but you ain't got nobody, you only got a gleam in your eyes, till somebody's found you, and put their loving arms around you. You got the feeling you want to die. But when the Lord up above you sends someone to love you, the blues are something new. Your soul is doing the things that you're doing. That love ain't got no time for blue. The 
hard for a woman on the road. You know, you, you have your piano player. With any luck, you have your rhythm section. So you hang with them. But you can't hang with them all the time. So you wind up sitting in your hotel room, watching TV, having a drink or whatever. And it's lonely. Her birthday was the 7th of April, and mine was the 8th. And so we, I would try. She wanted to hang out her birthday into mine, and then, you know, I never could make mine because she could, she used to drink uh, rum and Coke or gin and Coke at that time. And I don't know what I was drinking, if whatever. Uh, but I just couldn't ever keep up with her. No way to keep up with her. So by the time her birthday was almost over, I was home in bed. I never, and that's where I spent mine trying to recoup, recuperate, you know. But she was a very strong woman and strong-willed and could hold her her liquor and she could, you know, she could talk with her and everybody loved her. You have to be at your peak all the time. The public doesn't want to know that you've got a cold or whatever. They don't want to know. They've paid their money. They want you at your very top. And that's very hard to do night after night. We try to live 100 days in one day. And we try to please so many people. And we try to, like myself, I want to bend this note and bend that note and sing this way and sing that way and get all the feeling and eat all the good foods and travel all the way in one day. You can't do it. All of me, why not take all of me? Can't you see Hard living caught up with Billy in 1947. Nine and a half months in prison made her wonder if she still had a voice or an audience that remembered. Her answer came shortly after her release when she played Carnegie Hall. Her audience, overflowing onto the stage, stamped and whistled its adoration, and her voice, according to her pianist Bobby Tucker, was never silkier or more evocative. Well, when Billy got in trouble, I think it was the time in Philadelphia, and uh, she couldn't work. The liquor board wouldn't w let her work nightclubs in New York, and that, that was her biggest scene, the 52nd Street in Manhattan and in New York. She could work theaters, but she couldn't work any place where they sold booze. It was a terrible law, and it was very, very detrimental to her. I mean, that's stopping you from working. It's your livelihood. In her own city, Billy was only able to play big stages. Still, she continued working clubs from Maine to California. In 1954, Leonard Feather starred her in the first of her two European tours. And later that year, she mesmerized the crowd at the premier Newport Jazz Festival. The 50s also bought recordings with Norman Grant's cleft label in the classic holiday format, small groups with brilliantly simpatico rhythm and horns. Still, she missed terribly the intimacy of New York club life. John Lee ran the Ebony Club on 52nd Street. He was a big-time operator, taking an interest in a chick fresh out of jail. <laughs> Trouble started when Levy booked me into the Strand Theater on Broadway. Everybody was happy about the crowds that would flock to the theater. Everybody thought this was great. Except me. I thought people would just come and see how high I was. All I know is I'm in love with you. Even though you say that we are through, I know without your love. Darling, if that's not enough, I'll do anything. 
of people and the problems of uh, performers, especially jazz performers, is something that's been built up by, by reporters and they are given to expect it and uh, they come to see it. If you're in a world of entertainment, alcoholism and addiction are things that are most available to you and they don't necessarily have to do with failure or pain of... of uh, uh, you know, of some personal sort, when you're at your happiest time, you could get hooked because it is an occupational hazard in that world. She was wild, all right. I think we all were kind of wild at this time. She loved the music. She loved the people that played it. And as she lived her life as a musician. She, she showed me everything in life, you know. We talked a lot about life and things like that and people and music and everything, and I, I was her student. My man don't love me He treats me oh so mean My man He don't love me He treats me awful me.
and I'll stay home every day. Just treat me right, baby, and I'll stay home night and day. But you're so mean to me, baby. I know you're gonna drive me away Love is just like a faucet It turns off and on Love is like a faucet It turns off and on on, baby, it has turned off and gone. You can see the look in her eyes. The reason I love that film is you can see the shine in her eyes when she's listening to the guys backing her up. And they were all champions, and she was a champion. Who can ask for anything more? I've got enough of that Fagin Irish in me to believe that if the curtains are washed, company never comes. Tired, you bet. But all that I'll soon forget with my man. I hated that book. It was a sensationalized version of her life. There were phrases in it that I felt should not have been in there. Because she did have an incredible story. I remember when I read it that there was some stuff that I said, no, no, lady, because I was there, you know, and that's not, unless I was crazy and looking the other way or something. I felt that she was being used. Pieced together from interviews, Billy's autobiography, Lady Sings the Blues, was William Dufty's version of the singer's life. Billy seems to have let Dufty do the job to get much-needed cash. Pianist Carl Drinkard said she never worked on it herself, probably never read it. It's the elegance of the universality of her musical statement uh, that matters. That's what's important. I don't know anybody that has been a singer that has had as many hits as Lady Day. Everything she made eventually turned to a hit record and they purposely didn't give her good songs to sing. But she would sing them and the the little songs that she sang that were worth a nickel then. Such songs as What a Little Moonlight Can Do. You're in love. Your heart's a flooding all day long. You only stutter cause your poor tongue. Just from that other than words. I love you. Ooh. What a little moonlight can do. <laughs> She made everything she did great. I made her last record with her, which was called Lady in Satin. It was arranged by Ray Ellis. And uh, there's no need for me to tell you that if you're a Billie Holiday fan, that uh, the difference in the voice from 15, prior, 15 years prior to that. Lady in Satin? Her voice wasn't anywhere... Like it. But boy, I still listen to that. I have three of those albums because I don't want to wear them out. I, I 
I cry. I listen to I'm a fool to want you and oh, it breaks my heart. And I just say, sing it, lady. And 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 her voice wasn't the, but it was so effective. It was much more effective then to me than it was when it was in great shape. She had soul. I mean, you know, people say, Oh, the voice not for me. There's a whole life in that voice. At the time of Billy's 1959 performance at the Phoenix Theater, her last, she was not hooked on heroin. It was her heart that failed. Nonetheless, in the hospital just before she died, she was booked for possession. A packet of heroin had turned up in her room. The $15, $50 bills found taped to her leg were evidently all the money she had. It is sad beyond words, said critic Ralph Leeson, that she never knew how many people loved her. Lady Day was magic, said Frank Sinatra 30 years later. Her special talent and warmth are forever burned into my memory. With Louis Armstrong, she created modern jazz singing. Brief and stormy, hers was a life of vast influence, where what matters most is her elegant inventiveness, the universality of her musical statement. I'm a fool. To warn you Pity me, I need you I know it's wrong It must be wrong But right or wrong I can't 